in the end after this maneuver we were um, so close to Kwetugunaval that from a MiG taxiing on the runway until it was above us ready to throw its bombs it was something like three minutes or something like that you know we were very close to them um, and during this stage at one one morning you know we were traveling right through the night and during at when it the, the, the sun came up we were still traveling and everyone knew that it was extremely dangerous but our command had got lost so he carried on traveling and you know you cannot just stop you have to follow them otherwise you get lost you don't know where you're going to you don't know anything you're just traveling the convoy so what happened at this stage was he explained to us that we had to wait where we were and he went forward um, he didn't give clear instructions he just said wait you know at that stage some of us decided that we were going to camo the vehicles the problem with that was if you do camo the vehicle the camo net gets stuck in the bushes and in the vehicle and everywhere you cannot just roll it up within five minutes and get going again it, it takes a while to 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 um, to clear this up again so we were not sure you know if if he came back and said rush rush go then we would not be able to but on the other hand while we were sitting there we were totally exposed so a few of us decided that we were not taking the risk we were going to come out anyway I, I was busy camoing rolling out the net and putting in bushes and stuff when I heard uh, fighter aircraft and at that stage because of our experiences you know when you hear fighter aircraft you know it, it's extreme danger so while I was standing on top of the truck camoing I heard this when I looked up I saw one aircraft flying very low and very slow coming over us you know basically the direction we were traveling and he came in the opposite direction of us and um, I stood there and I watched and I didn't hear him turn around or anything so I, I got the impression that because he was so low you know he was looking maybe further out from the aircraft and he didn't see us right below him but uh, what I didn't know whether was that he did spot us and what I heard afterwards was that this was a Russian pilot and then he, he turned around, he radioed in and when he came in for, this, for the second round there was already a, a, a Afrikaans they call it an escadron uh, I'm not sure what you call it in English a whole group of aeroplanes already bombed up and taking off and ready on their way towards us as I said we were not so far from Kutukonaval at that stage so they could reach us quite quickly then when he came in for the second round um, I just climbed off the truck. I was standing next to the truck and I saw the aircraft coming in. Now at that stage we were traveling all night. We were all, all of us extremely tired, you know, uh, the dust, this fine dust and the dust sits in your eyes, you know, it causes mud and you rub your eyes, you know, you, you, you in a bit of a state. But anyway, I was standing there and I was watching this MiG come over. I think it was a MiG-21 or MiG-23, I'm not absolutely sure. And I saw the bomb underneath it detach and it started falling slowly. It was quite a big bomb, you know, it was either 500 pound or a 1,000 pound bomb. And it was falling for a while and then I saw a parachute behind it deploy. And at that stage, I'm not sure if it was the tiredness or the, the whatever, but I was, you know, I was just stuck there. I was just standing watching and didn't register what was going on. So I saw this bomb fall and then it exploded. It was one massive explosion, you know, from where I stood, I would guess about 100 meters, you know, just a ball of flame. And then after that, I heard somebody screaming. And only then did it start, you know, registering, you know, this was going on. I was standing there right next to a truck full of ammunition, you know, just watching this. And then I rushed in. The bomb hit just behind the, the turret on the body of the Aratl, and it, it went in. It was so big, the explosion, that it, it broke the, the, we call it the romp, and it went in. Um, okay. The guy that was taking the water, the, the gunner, he's, if I can quickly explain, this part of his leg was, was shot away. Only the tendon at the back was there. And the, the piece of the leg that was, you know, it was like he had his boots and his socks and everything on. It went through the, the, his browns, his socks and his boots like a knife through butter. You know, it was cut, cut clean. You know, there wasn't even uh, threads or anything sticking out. It was clean cut. And the part of the leg, you know, that was cut off, you could see the, the bones and the, the fat and the flesh sticking out. But anyway, he was the guy that was screaming. The driver that was lying inside, uh, the Jager, the shrapnel of the explosion pierced his body all over. For example, in the back of his head, there was a piece of shrapnel that went into the floor you know, underneath the grid and then ricocheted into his head. As I said, Duncan Taylor took him out and he carried him away a few meters. And then I rocked up there, you know, I took a stretcher and I ran there and then um, we put him on the stretcher and then the, the medics came and they started helping him. So Fricky was lying there, you know, he had, his beard was singed by the explosion and he was full of holes. You could see the holes and you see the blood, you know, spreading around it. And he was pleading with us to help him, you know, he was uh, moaning over the pain and pleading with us to help him.
and we were just watching him, you know, there was nothing we could do. You know, we tried to console him a little bit and tell him, you know, be patient, you know, the help is on its way and stuff like that, you know, but it wasn't real much of a help. And also because we were so far into Angola and we couldn't have air support, the choppers could only come in at night to, to Kazovac. Used to we call it Kazovac uh, casualty evacuation. So it took him about eight hours to die. And only after nightfall the choppers came in, so he was already dead by then. The uh, other guy, um, I cannot remember his name right now, the gunner that lost his foot, he was also lying there in pain and you know, because of because we used to Kazovac all our injured and all our dead, they just left the dead to rot. So the flies were terrible, you know, there was um, yes, you know, it, it was bad. So we tried to, you know, make it as comfortable as possible for them. But for example, Fricky, they gave him three morphine injections before he could really, you know, lie still, you know, they could work with him. But yes, that's the way things worked out, you know, there was bad things and in, in some mir miraculous way, you know, it worked out well as well.